Hey everybody, welcome back to Gideon Stuff. Today we're taking a look at this little knife here, obviously, because that's what's on the table. This is the Browning Plateau. I picked this up about a month ago, and I think I'm ready to review it. Uh, kind of an interesting little piece for a couple of reasons. We're gonna go ahead and zoom out here just a little bit. There we go. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and get this show on the road. So, blade length here, we're coming in at, well, let's measure the sharpened edge. Sharpened edge is just a hair over three inches. If we go all the way back to here, we're under three and a half inches. So, kind of a medium-sized knife. Uh, since we've got the big ruler out here today instead of the small ones, let's go ahead and do an overall length. Uh, just shy of eight inches. We're coming in at pretty much seven and a half inches. Exactly. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, let's go ahead and get our size comparisons out of the way. Move that guy here. Here's our Ontario Rat 1 and the 2. So this fits in very nicely between these two knives. Um, we will be coming back to that uh, later. Next up, let's go ahead and grab our Civivis. Here is the Elementum, and here's the Praxis. I don't know which I like better. Should I put the big knife on the bottom, big knife on the top? Eh, I don't know. There we go. Again, kind of in between, a little bit bigger than the Elementum, not quite as big as the Praxis. And let's go ahead and grab our flagship comparisons. There's the PM2 and the Benchmade Bugout. Pretty close in size to the Bugout, honestly. Very, very close. And I don't have anything but... Actually, actually, that's a straight up lie. <laughs> oh, I was going to say I don't have anything by Browning to compare this to because, you know, usually I like to compare things within a brand. Uh, but I, I actually do. However, it's not a knife. Um, let's go ahead and let's tilt up and let's turn this way. <laughs> Excuse the crampedness here. I have a browning uh, hunting bow. I had actually forgotten that this was a browning. This was given to me when I graduated high school by my ag teacher's husband. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I haven't shot it in forever. I've been so busy doing things. Although also I've never actually used it um, in a hunt. I normally hunt, uh, every bow hunt I've ever done, I've done with three curves like this old one here, which I need to get restrung and take it out and shoot some because I haven't been <laughs> fired it in forever, but we're not going to be doing a set here. Size comparison. Ta-da! That was fun. <laughs> let's go ahead. Uh, let's talk about the materials real quick. This is a D2 steel blade, kind of a um, sheep's foot, I'm going to call it a sheep's foot. They call it a cleaver. Browning calls it a cleaver. I'm going to call it a sheep's foot. We have the sheep's foot D2 steel blade, G10 scale, steel liner, steel clip, and it is a spring-assisted knife. So let's go ahead and go to the cutting footage. I I'm an idiot. I... I'm just a gosh darn idiot. Why do you guys watch this channel? So I drove out here to do review cutting today and stuff. You can see I've got my rig set up back there. Drove out here in the uh, ATV Little Ranger. I'm gonna be doing the review cutting with the Browning Plateau. And there's a little bit of a windy spell for a little bit so I was sitting in the cab waiting for that to pass. Just kind of fiddling with the knife here on the, uh, here on the dash. And I set it down, it slid off here, and now it's sitting down here where the shell of the vehicle connects the actual vehicle. Can, can I get it out? I have no idea. Gosh, I'm just dumb. Okay, we're going to go fishing for that. And uh, if I'm successful in procuring it, um, we'll go ahead and do some review cutting today. We'll see. Well guys, I was able to retrieve the Browning Plateau from 
the dark, dry hole I dropped it down. And here it is, and we're going to talk about it. This is um, a very budget-friendly knife. I mean, you guys have heard the whole spiel I've already given at the table at this point, but I am really glad that I had the opportunity, or that I decided um, to take the opportunity to check out this knife. Now, it has a geology theme. It's called the Plateau. So, you guys know we're going to nerd out about it, just a little bit. As I'm sure a lot of you are aware, a plateau is an elevated area of land that has a flat top. Shut up, car. Try to give a geology lecture. Thank you. And typically a plateau has to have one or more sides that are very steep. Some famous examples of plateaus include the Tibetan Plateau, which is located where India is smashing into Asia, uplifting the entire block of land. That's where the Himalayas are. Um, a famous North American plateau is the Colorado Plateau. It occupies kind of the uh, four corners states. Um, a lot of old basement rock has been uplifted and brought to the top. And right now, I'm actually standing on another plateau, one that actually borders the Colorado Plateau, and that's the Taos Plateau in northern New Mexico. This is also called the Taos Volcanic Field, and it is a plateau about 7,000 thousand square kilometers which in freedom units is um, like 2,800 square miles I might have to double check my math on that but I think that's what it is and it's comprised primarily of volcanic rocks as the name volcanic field might imply um, mainly basalts and andesites but there are some rhyolite domes actually Two, the only two rhyolite domes on the plateau are just right over there. In fact, you know what? Why not? Why not? Let's show them. Let's show them. There they are. Beautiful. Also of note, behind me right here is the tallest volcano. The biggest volcano, too, on the entire uh, plateau. This is San Antonio Mountain, and it is just... A few feet shy of 11,000 feet, I believe. I think it's 10,908 feet, something like that. But yeah, very, very large, very prominent volcano. It's an excellent landmark. You can see this thing as far as Santa Fe. Uh, if you're coming out of Santa Fe, coming down to Kasuke, you come down there, and if you're, you're on the, the highway and you look out towards the north, you can see this in the distance, which is pretty cool. It's a big day site um, volcano and uh, yeah that's enough geology right now. The plateau itself actually right now where I'm standing right here um, we're at an elevation of 8,400 feet I think somewhere around there. Actually it might be 8,000 closer to 8,000. I can't remember if it's 8,400 or 8,600. Something somewhere in there um, and the age of the volcanic field is, I mean, all these flows and tufts were erupted uh, between 5 million and 1.5 million years ago. Uh, there are some older flows, about 20, 22 million years old, but um, the, main, the main bulk of the volcanism, including the Servietta Basalt, which is what makes up most of the field, is in that... Uh, I think the subject of the basalt is 5 million to 3.5, something like that. And then these rhyolites are in that um, lower age bracket. All right, enough geology. I get excited. You guys, you guys got to forgive me. So let's go ahead and talk about the knife here, the Browning Plateau. Uh, let's go ahead and start off with the action. Yes, it is assisted... And it's a pretty unremarkable assist. You do have thumb studs and a flipper tab, so you have that multiple deployment stuff going on. Fun and games, right? Um, but yeah, it is assisted. A lot of people are not going to like that. Um, it's running on Teflon washers. The, I really, really doubt you could de-assist this successfully. I have not tried um, because 
I am 99% certain that the effort would be futile. So that's what it is. If you like assisted opening knives, you might like this. Again, it's not the greatest assist ever, but it's it's good. It's not it's not terrible. It really is just a spring flinging that blade out. Uh, let's talk about the carry. So we have a tip-up deep carry pocket clip that is reversible. Thank goodness. Thank you, Browning. Thank you. Browning got it right, where so many other companies consistently get it wrong. I am sorry also for the noise of the highway next to me. They're actually doing road work over there. It sucks. Uh, and also I apologize for the wind, but hey, plateau. Wind just blows across it. Okay, so let's look at it in the pocket. Let's tilt down here. Let's take that out of the pocket. Simcut Serene, awesome knife. Just been loving it. Actually works pretty good in the pocket. I don't have really any complaints. I think this is a really good clip. In a lot of ways, it kind of reminds me of the bug out clip, a little bit thinner, but kind of similar. It does have the browning deer head on it, as well as in the scales, so that's cool. Um, Before you get into our cutting, let's talk about the ergonomics a little bit. Pretty neutrally shaped. Gonna wait for that convoy of truckers to go by. Uh, pretty neutrally shaped, um, so the ergonomic lines are actually very good. What's not good with the ergonomics, though, is the fact that these edges are just sharp. They're 90 degree angles. They did not shaft these edges. They didn't round them over at all. And when you're bearing down, you can feel it. Alrighty, let's go ahead and do some cutting with this D2 sheep's foot blade. I'm calling it a sheep's foot. If you want to fight with me, we'll fight. All right, there we go. First thing first, grab some of our cardboard. Uh, I left the tape on this because this is a great blade shape for utility cuts. Get through that tape. Utility cuts for days. Let's do some slicing. It does have a hollow grind, which is pretty interesting. See if that was the tape or the knife. Yeah, pretty sure it's the knife. Not the most amazing slicer. Um, it's not the thinnest thing. It, actually, it feels, it does have a decently thin edge, but it is sharp and pretty wonky. And there's also, I can feel with my finger, some like lumpiness in the grind that they need to sort out. So that's, that's not great. Okay. Let's go ahead and grab this thing here. Okay, that felt pretty good. This test might be a little bit odd. Yeah, not very good, but straight edges rarely do well on that, so we'll give them a pass. All right, pull noodle. I'll tell you what, guys, it has been a long time since I've done a review cutting. I'm not sure if you can tell. All right. Okay. Okay, interesting. So I definitely felt a little bit of weirdness in the grind where I was saying I could feel that lumpiness. And it kind of threw me off course a little bit on a couple of these cuts. 
But once I recognized it was there and I kind of adjusted for it, I was able to make a really, really nice cut through that pool noodle and it didn't bind at all. So that's that's pretty good. You know, I'm not gonna complain a whole lot. That's, that's not bad. As far as a user goes, um, a budget user knife, I think it passes, it's fine. Is it amazing? No, but uh, it's not bad either. All right, let's go ahead and get back to the table. We have no tip on this thing, so I'm, wondering, I'm curious to see how this throw works. About like I expected. Let's get back to the table. Alrighty, we're back. Let's go ahead and get into what I'm liking and not liking about this kind of odd little knife. First of all, I think this is actually a really good looking design. It definitely caught my eye. This is a pretty unique blade shape. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it, I, I wouldn't necessarily say this is a good looking knife, but it's a unique looking knife. And again, it caught my eye. That's why I decided to pick it up and review it. And here it is. And they did a lot of things um, to kind of add to the aesthetics. For example, they did a pivot collar. If you guys know me, you know that I love pivot collars. CGRB does them a lot, and I, I think it's a really easy way to class up a knife, especially a budget knife. You know, just adding a pivot collar makes it a little classier. And these ones, you know, they're just black, plastic, or G10, but uh, hey, it's nice that they're there, right? They also have the little browning uh, deer head logo here. That's cool, right? It is on both sides. So yeah, um, they did put some aesthetic touches on this, and I think that's really cool. Next thing I like is the stone wash on the blade. Um, it's not the most amazing stone wash, but it's a pretty good one. It's decent, right? The thing I really like about it is that it will hide wear and scratches. And for a knife that is probably going to be a beater knife, a knife that you're going to be using a lot, that's nice, you know? Are you going to care too much if this thing gets beat up? Are you going to care if it starts showing its its age? Probably not, but hey, it, it's nice that they thought about that, right? Next thing. The carry. Um, this knife has a very, very good clip. Again, you can see the browning logo on there. Some people might not like that. I don't mind. Um, but yeah, good clip, great retention. It falls on this smooth part of the G10, which means it's easy in and out of the pocket. It also falls on a recessed part of the G10. So, you know, again, just smooth in and out of the pocket. We do have flat screws. Focus in there. Flat screws, which is awesome and the clip is reversible. That's fantastic, I love seeing that. Um, having a reversible clip on a knife is definitely a must these days, right? I don't think there's any excuse for a knife to not have a reversible clip. Oh, it's gonna mess up the aesthetics. Oh, and you didn't want any hose on the other side of the knife. Okay, maybe if it's a super fancy knife that's got a very exotic scale material on one side, okay. Okay, maybe, maybe. But if it's just a G10 slab, drill some dang holes in it. Give those lefties some love. They exist, they're out there, and they carry pocket knives. All right, I'm getting off my soapbox now. But seriously, come on. Browning got this right. A lot of companies are not getting this right. And it's frustrating. It's eternally frustrating. I'm not even left-handed, and I find it frustrating. So I'm glad to see Browning doing it here. Next thing, the ergonomics on this knife um, are actually pretty uh, good. We will be coming back to the ergonomics. You guys already heard in the cutting footage, uh, but the ergonomic lines are nice. I really like how they did this G10 here. Um, the texture up here is kind of a, focus up camera. Thank you, we got kind of a checkered pattern up here and it's kind of um, not quite smoothed out, but it's definitely cut away differently and you can see it is smoother. You've got kind of a, compound grind <laughs> on the handle. Um, yeah, that's what this is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Compound ground handle. Uh, very interesting. But yeah, um, the overall profile is very neutral. It is hand filling. And those those grooves there definitely give you something to, to hold on to. So I really appreciate that. As far as utility on this knife goes, um, 
yeah, it, it works just fine, right? You do have a hollow grind here. Um, you can get to that tip really easily. This is a fantastic utility cutter. Straight edge. It's not going to win any awards for performance, as you guys saw in the cutting footage, but it's also not bad. This is definitely a 100% usable knife. I think this is a very interesting blade shape, a very useful blade shape, and the ergonomics complement the blade very, very nicely, which I always appreciate. So there is that. Um, speaking of, let's see, how's it? I, I've carried it for a little while. I have not done anything to the edge. We'll talk about that later. Let's see how sharp it is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's still got a working edge. You can see here that that's not the cleanest cut, kind of fuzzy, but I mean, I have been using this knife and uh, yeah. D2 steel, G10. These are great materials uh, for the price, which is about 35 bucks. Um, I think that's that's very solid. I like them, you know, trying to come in at that price. Another thing that's really good is access to the lock bar. They gave you plenty of access to that lock bar, and uh, yeah, that is really really good. Okay, let's go ahead and start talking about things I don't like. Um, this thing is assisted, and I don't hate assisted knives. I think assisted knives do have a place for people who maybe lack. Um, a whole lot of dexterity or strength in their hands for people who really want to have something that's easy to open one-handed and fast and reliable. Uh, there is definitely a place for assisted opening knives. This, it's not a terrible assist, but it's not a great one either. Um, you definitely can tell a difference between Different assisted opening mechanisms out there. Kershaw, for example, their speed safe does very, very well. That's a great assist. Um, CRKTs, whatever it is they're using, now they have like the bearings in there and stuff. Very good assist. This one, I mean, this is a speed safe style assist, I'm pretty sure. Um, but yeah, it's just not quite as, uh, as refined. They do give you multiple deployment options, which, you know, this is fun. Um, but let's go ahead and talk about those deployment options. So you cannot de-assist this knife. It has Teflon washers in the pivot, basically no detent, and this flipper tab, look how low it is compared to the center line of the pivot. You get no leverage off this flipper tab, and so you need the assist if you're going to be using the flipper tab to open it. There's also no jumping on the flipper tab. It just kind of sticks out there like a little nub, you know, whatever. The thumb studs are absolutely horrendous. <laughs> let's look at these. They're tall and narrow and a little bit sharp around the edges. In fact, I tried to file down this one, not this one because I don't use it as much, but I tried to file the side down on this one. It didn't really help. It just made it a little bit sharper. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, very sharp, very pokey. And with this assist, yeah, they're just not all that comfortable. And you can see here, even on my calloused and worn out thumb, yeah, it kind of leaves a little bit of a divot. Um, so yeah, do not like these thumb studs at all. Um, the, one thing I'll give them credit for though is like this little chamfer here makes it easy to slide up on that thumb stud. So I like that. Um, next, let's talk about just some fit and finish things. Uh, it is not centered. The pivot is free spinning, which is very frustrating. The pocket clip screws, focus up their camera stick way into the scales, which I'm never a big fan of. And there is a little bit of side-to-side -side play that's developed, and it's hard to fix because, you know, free-spinning pivot. And the lock rock is still there. If you guys remember from the unboxing, uh, it had some lock rock. It has gotten better. I will say it has gotten better through use. But you can still hear it there, right? So as time goes on, the lock bar will probably move over and the lock stick will probably go away. That happens sometimes, but you know, still not great. The next thing, the sharpening on this was absolutely atrocious. And this is one of the reasons I did not, I decided not to touch up the edge before this review because I wanted to show you guys. See how tiny it gets down there? And then we get wide. We get to that awful termination there. Let's flip it around. 
Mm-hmm. And then we got, get pretty wavy over there. Now, I am not like Jake from Canadian Cutting Edge. I don't measure, um, you know, three different places along the blade to get the uh, um, sharpening angles. But just eyeballing it, this is pretty dang bad. Pretty dang bad. So, yeah, not great. Another thing is there's a weird little thing in the grind right up here. I, I can't really see it. I, I doubt I can show it on camera. But there's an area here where the grind is just thick. Like they didn't finish grinding out this hollow. You feel like a little bump. Bump. So, yeah, a little bit odd there. Um, they don't have D2 marked on the blade anywhere, which I always like to have steel markings. Um, some people don't. Uh, the branding is probably going to be a little bit much for some people. I honestly think it's, you know, pretty, uh, pretty subdued. I like that they put browning here on the flats and they just have the model number over there. I think that branding's okay, so people might not like it. Um, but yeah, you know, those finish issues, they, they do stack up, right? And they're not great. I could probably fix a lot of them if I really wanted to take the time to sit down and work on this knife. You know, reprofiling the edge won't be a problem. You know, I can get multiple tools and, you know, fix up the centering. I could probably file down those screws if I really wanted to. Um, I could reprofile the lockup. But, you know, I'm not going to, right? I'm not going to. My biggest complaint with this knife, however, is ergonomics. These corners here, these are just sharp 90 degree edges. Can you guys see how sharp these edges here are and that makes this handle that otherwise would have been actually pretty darn comfortable just miserable I can't really feel the clip which is awesome but man right in here those scales just dig in and again I've got pretty calloused hands but gosh they dig in and it's just not a fun time those definitely need to be rounded over and they rounded this part over beautifully they did a fantastic job up here rounding that over chamfering it you know they gave it kind of this i don't know 120 degree angle kind of going through there not 120 <laughs> maybe 120 anyways kind of gave it a little angle through there um and it, it it helps but they didn't do it down here and i don't know why i don't know why so, final conclusions. 35 bucks is not a lot to spend on a knife. But I wouldn't recommend you just run out and buy this, right? This is not something you necessarily need in your life. However, I know that sounds kind of mean, but this is one of my favorite... Th these are the types of reviews that I absolutely love doing because this knife has a lot of flaws. It does. Is this a good knife? No. Is it better than a lot of gas station stuff? I'm going to say, eh, yeah, actually it is. It's got better materials, the D2 steel, the G10, things like that, reversible clip. You know, it's got some nice features, but it's not really a great knife. However, I see a lot of potential in this. And instead of just leaving my review on the whole, well, here's what I found that's wrong with it, and yuck, 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 do not buy this knife, I do not recommend it, I'm actually going to give Browning some tips. I know no one from Browning's ever going to watch this, right? I, I know it. I know it. If you know someone that works at Browning, send them this this video because, you know, I really want them to to to, to see this because I think this knife design has a potential to be really, really cool. So, here's what I'm thinking. Obviously, first thing, dial in those fit and finish issues, right? Make sure it's centered, maybe have a captured pivot. In fact, definitely have a captured pivot. Just dial that stuff in. Next thing, get rid of the assist, change these thumb studs, and get rid of the flipper tab. No flipper tab, just thumb studs, dial in the detent, and put it on phosphor bronze washers. Then, obviously, round over these corners, and I think that this knife would be a competitor, or maybe even 
a complimentary piece to the rats. I know, this is... Hear me out, okay? Hear me out. Look, the rats are awesome. But something that I feel, and I think a lot of people feel too, is that this... I mean, this is a big knife, and this is a pretty small knife. I think a lot of people wish there was a rat that was more this size. Now, if they can keep this at $35 and implement those changes that I just suggested, again, I don't really expect anyone to take this seriously. I'm just, you know, daydreaming here, speculating. If they were to keep this at $35, the D2 steel, the G10, and implement those changes that I just went over, I think this would be a really, really interesting piece kind of geared towards that same market as the rats. And with this new blade shape, this is this kind of reminds me of a rat that's more of a utility cutter. This is an excellent warehouse knife. If you're finding yourself doing a lot of utility cuts, this is where it's at. And you've got plenty of edge if you want to do some straight pushes. But I really think this design has a lot of potential. I love this blade shape. I really do. I cannot stress that enough. I think this is a fantastic blade shape. I think the handle is really good. Round this over and it'll be amazing. Right? I think this has the startings of something really special. And if Browning wanted to go through and make some QC changes and do something different with this, you know, whether they make the changes I suggested or not, I think they would have something really, really special on their hands. I really do. Because, like I said, this is a good design. I really do like this design. Now, you might be thinking, well, you know, browning, knives aren't really their thing, right? Right, but I was on the browning site the other day looking through some of their stuff in the knives category, and they have some pretty interesting things that I want to check out. I think... I think a lot of companies are kind of realizing the potential that the knife community has for their for, for, for their products. You know, that, that's a market that I think a lot of companies are trying to step more into. You know, companies like Browning or Smith & Wesson and, and, you know, Remington, companies like this, you know, they've made firearms, they've made hunting supplies, things like that, and they've always made knives, but they've never really tried to make a good knife, right? They just make these generic knives. A lot of them, it's the exact same patterns. They buy them from the same warehouse. They just stamp their own brand on it. And they flood the Cabela's and Sportsman's warehouses and things with them. And people just buy them because, you know, oh, look, here's a $13 knife that says Remington on it. He he who, this is probably going to be as good as my Remington gun, right? But I think... I think now a lot of these companies are starting to realize that there's a huge market they're missing out on, right? Or at least there's also a huge part of their current, not fan base, but current, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Gosh sakes. Their current consumer base. There we go. Come on, you used to be a salesman. Uh, their current consumers base that they're already buying the guns they're already buying the you know the bows like i have over here and they also love knives but they're going somewhere else for the knives right they're going somewhere else and i think some of these companies are like hey you know what why don't we just keep them here you know why don't we give them yeah you know here's your remington ammo you want to buy a high quality knife with that or i mean i keep using remington let's just use browning since that's what's on the table here right and so i think very slowly we're seeing these companies start to kind of kind of poke into the knife enthusiast part of the world, right? And I think that's good because the more they try and do that, the better the knives for just regular people. Gosh, I hate saying that way. The knives are the normies. But, you know, the knives that the people who aren't necessarily knife people are buying, they're going to keep getting better and better. You know, as, as these companies just keep trying to advance their own products and keep up with other trends in the knife world, the end result is going to be that we're going to see better knives at these price at these, you know, not necessarily prices, but categories that have not been known for quality. You know, I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest. If you're looking for a knife, if you're a knife enthusiast and you're looking for a knife, are you going to go to Cabela's and look through the knives that are just hanging on the shelves? 
No. If you're going to go to a Cabela's at all, you're going to go and look at the stuff that's in the display cases, right? Because you know the, that by and large, the stuff hanging on the in the blister packs is crap. Now, I like to dig through that stuff. In fact, I bought this at a sportsman's warehouse um, because I like digging through, you know, the blister pack stuff and seeing if I can find any hidden gems. But most knife guys just overlook this type of stuff, right? I think Browning is trying to reel them in. It's trying to say, hey, look, we can make cool stuff too. And Browning, if you're watching, which I really doubt, this is a very cool knife. I love this design. You've got some fit and finish issues. Uh, you've got some QC control that you need to get straightened out. Um, but I think you have the beginnings of something great. And that is where I'm going to leave you guys with this video. I know that was kind of a long one, but thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, leave it a like, comment below, and subscribe. I've been Gideon. I hope you have a wonderful day. Adios.